Hello everyone, uh, today we're here uh, to hear all about MicroPython from Nick Moore. Nick Moore is uh, one of the uh, contributors to the project. Please welcome Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for coming along. Um, this is a very strange way to talk to people because quite a few of them, you were behind my back, <laughs> which I'm not certain is my best angle. Um, but today is a little workshop to try and get people started with MicroPython. Um, as I've said to a few people, the, the, the real tragedy with these sorts of projects where you're dealing with embedded systems is when people get excited at conferences, they go out, they grab the hardware, they get really fired up, they get on the plane home, they put it in their bag, they get home, they put it in a desk drawer and they never think about it again until next year when they go, oh, bummer, I never did anything about that. And that's why you've all come along to this session, because you did that last year, probably. But, you know, so this is an attempt to have a little workshop where we just get you over that very first little get it plugged in, get it configured, what can I do with it, why do I care about this? And from there, you can start thinking about your own projects and cool things to do with them. Um, I'll talk about MicroPython in a minute, sorry. Um, the little boards that a lot of you have, have grabbed are very small, very cheap uh, boards called a witty cloud. They are very minimal boards, they don't do a lot, but they do have a couple of useful inputs and outputs on them, so they make a good little platform for us to play with today. Is, has everyone here got some kind of hardware that they can have a play with? Either that or one of the lollybots from Open Hardware Minicon or something like that, yeah? Anyone who hasn't, please put your hand up. No, cool, excellent. So, quick introduction to MicroPython. What's MicroPython? Well, it's an MIT licensed Python, about a Python 3.4, for the Pi board, for the micro bit, for the ESP8266, and for the ESP32. Um, created by Damien George, who's sitting over there. Not that I'm making a big fuss about this. Thanks for coming. Um, as a way to run a, a nice, civilised, embedded language on very, very small computers. I'm really excited about this because I, I really enjoy playing with embedded systems and I really enjoy writing stuff in Python. I, I find it uh, much more relaxing than writing in, in many other languages, including C. So I, I got into this idea that I could now write Python on these tiny embedded systems. And I was really excited about this. And so I got more and more into the MicroPython project and then I got involved with the ESP32 port of MicroPython, which was really exciting. And then I found myself contributing to that, which meant writing C on microcontrollers again. So there's some irony built into this project, I think. But these chips come from a, a Chinese fabulous manufacturer called Espressif. Um, they're, they're very small, as I say, very cheap chips, which have really, I think, redefined the market for what um, a microcontroller can do compared to like the, the AVRs and the 8-bit picks and that kind of family of chips that we've all gotten a bit used to by now. These really, really redefine things. They first came to prominence, I guess, in the open source world. I first remember hearing about them in, uh, I think, Geelong uh, Linux Conf, funnily enough. Um, and they first came to prominence as a kind of a, a controller that went on the side of an Arduino to handle Wi-Fi for it until eventually someone noticed that they're several times as powerful as an Arduino and that it was really a very strange relationship where you have 99% of your computing power over here in the communications controller. Um, and slowly people started to work out how we could do stuff with it. The company Espressif who make them really, I think, benefited a lot from the involvement of the open source community and really enjoyed that relationship and so their new product, the ESP32, is even more open and even more in sync with open source stuff. So I, I think that's really exciting. And it's more powerful and has more everything, which is really good. That's the CPU on the lollipop. My favourite photos of these things is from a bunch of Russian guys called Zepto Bars who boil chips down in acid to see what the dye looks like. And I just love these photos. They illustrate one of the cool parts about these things. In the, the main part of it is, is like the, the onboard RAM and all of that sort of stuff and is, is fairly boring, looks like a little car parking lot. The bit that looks like a chemical plant up in the top left there is actually a Wi-Fi radio and a Bluetooth radio built right into the silicon. Um, there's little coils of, the things that look like little coils of wire are actually little coils of wire on a tiny, tiny scale. They're little transformers and balins and all that sort of stuff. 
And I think it's amazing. It, it, it looks like a chemical plant or possibly a really difficult quake level to me. Mm. There's something about it that's just really exciting to think that we can actually do that. We can make a Wi-Fi radio right there on the chip. Um, they're available in many different modules and, and um, this confuses the hell out of people consistently, which is why I thought it was worth having a slide for. The 8266 comes in a huge range of modules with strange little ESP12 and ESP13 and all of this sort of different numbers and names and different sizes and all that. You can't go too far wrong with the ESP12 ones. They're kind of the most widespread ones. The ESP32 thankfully has a few less module packages available. That's the, the standard factor that people use. Um, available straight from Espresso. Uh, those edges, sorry, those edges on those modules are actually hand solderable as well. They're like postage stamp edges, but you can hand solder them with a little bit of practice. If you don't want to even hand solder anything, you can also buy these boards as little plug-in things like the Witty Cloud that we're using for today and Node MCU and Wemos D1 are very widespread um, 8266 boards, very useful. Uh, there's also a, hum a whole bunch of uh, ESP32 boards uh, available. There's the DevKit C from Espresso, uh, SparkFun, Adafruit and Wemos all have their own boards. And that uh, Lolin32 Lite is the one used on the, the Lollibot. Um, did anyone have a Lollibot along today, the, the Open Hardware Miniconf one? Yeah, yeah? cool. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. What can you use MicroPython for? Well, one of the really fun things we did with it was this year at BuzzConf, we did a, a project I call Rocket Surgery, where we had attendees, it's, oh, sorry, BuzzConf is a technology festival, but you're camping, which is kind of cool because it means you can let off compressed air water rockets as a session which UTS would be probably a little negative about if we tried to do it. Although some of those buildings are quite big. Um, so compressed air up to like 100 PSI, bunch of water, uh, fires the rocket in the air. That's exciting, but especially if the clouds are low, you don't see the rocket for long. And it's very hard to tell if your rocket design is getting better or worse. So what we did is we stuck an accelerometer and a barometer on there. And you can see this graph on the right here. We've got altitude on the top and we've got uh, acceleration on the bottom. And it didn't work perfectly, but we started to get some numbers back. The barometer is actually so accurate, we can get altitude within about a metre or so going up. And it was enough to, to see that we were really actually firing these rockets and they were going up to 30 or 40 metres. It was pretty exciting stuff. Why is that exciting about MicroPython? Well, because we wrote all this code and it used MQTT and that was really exciting and it sent all its telemetry back live over the conference network and that's pretty cool. Also, because it runs on a computer that costs five bucks so you can afford to stick it on top of a rocket full of water and fire it up in the air. We did get them all out of the trees eventually. Um, the other big use we've got for it this year is Lollibot, the open hardware miniconf robot. Um, that's using an ESP32 to control um, two motors and a servo and there's an accelerometer on it too because, well, they cost five bucks. Um, and a big lithium battery, try not to make that explode when you're in the air. Um, and they're a really fun little project. The idea is this can be a little soccer ball chasing robot. Um, so we built them on Monday as part of the Open Hardware Miniconf. Um, again, by having such a cheap CPU, we get to drive the whole price of the project right down and it moves things from being expensive toys to cheap toys, which is cool because it means you can actually let your kids play with them, unlike expensive toys where you go, no, maybe, maybe, honey, don't, don't, don't pick the robot up, don't take it to the sand pit. It's much better if you can just say, yeah, well, yeah, kill a few CPUs, won't really matter. All right, so that's my just introduction to what this is, why you should care, why you're here. In case any of you are in the wrong place, this is a good time to sneak out, but nonetheless. What I want to do now is basically just go hands on, run around, help everybody get over that first little bit, get it installed, get the, the I.O. stuff going, make sure that you're all actually working with it and hopefully this will avoid the dreaded desk drawer syndrome, right? Um, so myself and Damien are going to buzz around a little bit and just help everyone get over that initial thing and if you look at that repository at the top there, you can either clone it or just go to that URL. Um, uh, there's a bunch of introductory stuff. If you've got the um, Witty Cloud, there's a, a special page to go to for that. If you've got the Lollibot, there's a page to go to for that. If you've got your own hardware or whatever, um, just read through other parts of that, that site. 
and hopefully that's some materials that can get you going. At the end of the, the witty cloud thing, there's some exercises to try, turning lights on and off. As, you know, as soon as you get up to Blinky, you're an embedded hardware engineer. You know that, right? That's, that's, if you get as far as Throbby, that's like a master's in embedded hardware. So, um, so if you can get that going, um, and a few other things, try to make it do some interesting stuff. After that, we've got a, because this is like a double session, so in the middle there's a little short break so that people can go grab a cup of coffee or whatever and just generally step back a little moment. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, how networking works and how libraries work and all of that sort of stuff and a bit about how to build from source. And at the end of the session, oh, there's some more exercises there, and at the end of the session I'd like to talk a little bit about developing on MicroPython to sort of demystify that for people so that you know a little bit about it and hopefully feel like you can contribute back because my main motivation in coming along today and talking to everyone and doing this tutorial is to try and get more contributors into the project. We've, we've all, we're all open source people. We've been talking about open source. We've been dreaming about open source by now, I'm sure. The, there's no way this project can continue with a small number of people. It needs lots of people making contributions. They may be small, they may be big, but the more people we can get involved, the more people we can get on board on this project, the, the better it'll run, the more exciting it'll be. So, all right. Um, that's the end of my talk bit. Uh, I'll come around and talk to people. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, man, how you going? We're all good? Oh. Oh. All good? Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, We've had a bit of a play with this stuff. Hopefully everyone has got as far as a serial REPL and a bit of a play with how things are working. Um, it, we're coming up on lunchtime now, which means, of course, everyone is, is going, when do I get to have lunch? Uh, but before we do lunch, I'd just like to have a quick chat about how to develop in MicroPython. Um, because it's coming up to lunch, we won't get kicked out of this room straight away. So if people want to hang around for a while after this bit of talking, um, and do some more experimenting, do some more stuff. I'll be around. Um, I might nick downstairs and grab a sandwich or something. But uh, you're more than welcome to hang around and have a play up until we have to get kicked out of here for the next session to all get prepared. So, um, uh, yeah, without further ado, I'm just going to launch into a quick thing about developing MicroPython. Um, and then we'll still have a little bit of time to recap. And then thank you very much. So. One of the things I just wanted to talk about to people, people always ask me, this is great, I've got this MicroPython, I can see it, I can, I can use it, I can turn LEDs on and off, I feel really good about my life now. Um, and that's great, but I want to use it for this project. And for this project, I need this function, or this thing, or this other thing. I really can't, I, I can't go around implementing fast Fourier transforms in Python, can I? It won't be fast enough. And so one of the things I like to emphasize in this is, well, that's OK, because you can still embed C really easily into your MicroPython. And the other thing is that the newer chips, especially the ESP32, has a huge range of peripherals and really exciting new development in that library. Their SDK is continually being updated very rapidly. Um, and we really need help keeping up with that sort of process of how quickly that gets updated. So I'm really seeking more contributors, people who'd like to contribute to the code. So I just want to run you very quickly through a, a, a view of what's actually in the MicroPython repository so that we can work up towards the bit of having people contribute back and develop their own drivers in MicroPython and so on. So very quickly, if you look at the MicroPython main repo, GitHub MicroPython slash MicroPython, there's a whole pile of files in there and that can be a bit intimidating and so I want to do a quick tour of what's there. The first thing is, well, about half of those files in that top level are just documentation and things like that. So that's nice. They're not scary. That's a good start. There's a whole bunch of stuff, the drivers and some of the modules and some of the library code that is shared between the different ports. So that's not specific to any given one port. That might be some shared libraries that multiple ports use, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't need to worry too much about them just yet. And the actual ports to each of the different platforms are in a directory called slightly unimaginatively, ports. Um, particularly, I'm working on the ESP32 port, which is in that ports directory as port slash ESP32. 
if you look in there, now we're back to having a whole lot of files again and we're all scared again. But if you actually look at those files, a lot of those are just implementing those built-in modules. You've all been typing import machine a lot to get pins working. That's just loading up some code that lives in mod machine. As an example, when we load up, we import ESP, which is a way to, to get a whole bunch of ESP-specific routines. We can import the module, we can look in that module, we can see there's a whole bunch of things in that module. Those things come straight out of the C code. We can call a function called ESP.flash size, for example, which tells us the size of the flash on our device. So we're just going to do a quick dive down into where that comes from, how that data gets back to you, and how that works. That function is basically a, a function provided by the Espresso SDK called SPI flash get chip size, which is not terribly interesting, but you may need to know it. It's a C function, though. We, how do we call that from Python? Well, the first thing we've got to do is wrap it up so that we take a systems size T and turn it up into a MicroPython integer. So there's a function for that, MP object new int from new int will take that native C int and wrap it up into being a MicroPython object that is an integer. Um, and there you go. And we call that from a Python function, or from a C function, that returns a Python object and takes a void pointer. That's great. That's a C function that returns a Python object. That's not terribly good because we can't call that from Python. So we wrap that up and make a Python function out of it. So you're getting an idea here. We have wrappers of wrappers of wrappers. So we're wrapping up the C function to become a Python function. Um, and that's basically saying, look, define this thing. It's going to be a function. It's going to take no parameters. They all return a Python object or none, so that's OK. How does it know where to find that function? Uh, it needs a table of names. So we, we add to the name table here, this globals table for the module. We say flash size points to this function that wraps up a C function that will return me an integer wrapped up as a Python integer. And then all we really have to do is tell that module, this is where you find your symbol table. Then we tell the overall config, the overall port, how to find that module, how to compile it in. And now, when we go to call that function, it's there. We can call it just like a Python function. That's kind of like a very, very lightning dive down in and back up. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that all we're really doing is we're wrapping up C functions and into Python functions. We're wrapping up C objects into Python objects. We can also unwrap them to get parameters back down. It's actually a lot, it's a little intimidating when you first look at it, but it's a lot less scary once you start digging in and just trying stuff. So that's about that. Um, as I say, there's time for questions. There's time to hang around a little bit. Um, if you have updates, I've been making some updates to my notes as I've gone along. Um, thanks to everyone's feedback for that. Uh, but if you have more feedback, I'm definitely happy to take it. And um, yeah, thanks so much for coming along. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. So, question I have: MicroPython is an Australian project, right? Uh, yes. Well, I it's, started in Australia. It's 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 global. Yes. We started in Australia. Just one. Where, where were you at the time? Cambridge. Uh, I, I, I was in Cambridge when I started writing it, actually. But you're now you're here. Okay, but that's good. I'm in Melbourne, so it's, 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 it's great. Australian is Russell Crowe. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And this is a present from oh. organizers. Thank you. Are you sharing your time? No worries. Thank everyone. Thank you. And thanks for coming, everyone. And if you have further questions throughout the thing, just, just button hold me. I'm, I'm doing this because I think it's fantastic and I love it. So I will not be in the least offended to be buttonholed over lunch, beers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks for coming along. Yeah, could I ask, with the ESP32 port, yep. is that running on top of free alpha? Uh, yes. And is there any way within MicroPython to spawn off tasks? There's lots of... Uh, support for multi-threading, either to have um, async I/O uh, is one way to do it, or there's a threading library, or you can just write things asynchronously and have them happen to be there at the right time. Um, yeah. The yeah, I was going to say, is the is the native threading actually calling an RTOS thread or is it our own? Yes, it'll make cool. 
There you go. Can you also Sorry, yes. <laughs> Import underscore thread. We'll get you straight to the to the library, clarifies Damien for, for the free RTOS threads. You can also, I, I've been experimenting a little bit, you can also run your own code in a separate free RTOS thread beside the MicroPython interpreter. So if you happen to have some stuff that really needs its own thread, maybe the real-time loop in whatever project you're doing needs to have the performance you can get from writing it in C and having it in its own thread, you can actually run MicroPython's threads next to your own threads. So that, that might work well for you too. Yep. So are there boards in which it's running on bare metal? The original port for the 66 was running without any RTOS at all. Um, what's the other boards use? I think we should get Damien to come and answer this one. There you go. Do you want to grab a nice. Lichten mic or something? There you go. It's okay. So the question was, uh, is MicroPython running bare metal on other ports? Yes. Um, so the original, the original port of MicroPython to the STM32 line of chips runs completely bare metal. So it, the code there has all of the uh, startup and interrupt vector code and copying the BSS, initializing, it's called copying the data section, initializing BSS and so on. So it does all of that stuff in the STM port and there's also there are a few other ports to like a PIC 16 bit microcontroller which is completely bare metal and um, uh, there's the CC3200 Texas Instruments chip which is running on free RTOS um, so there are many different ways it can it can be done but definitely it can run on bare metal and I think even there's someone who has got it running on a Raspberry Pi bare metal so you boot straight into MicroPython uh, um, so yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty flexible in the way you can use it. Thanks, David. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, thanks everyone.